All right, Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast and brought to you by Dr. Lyle M. Back. For everything from skin care to cosmetic surgery, go to ilovelyleback.com or call 856-MAKEOVER for Dr. Lyle M. Back, proud sponsor of Football at Four. Andrew DiCecco is in the house today, and he's in the uh, hot seat for the Carson Wentz. Could be a trade happening while he's on the phone. We'll get his take on all of it right now here on Football at Four on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. Andrew, what's going on, man? Uh, Not much, Mike. Just trying to digest all this Carson Wentz information. You know, I I can't go on Twitter without seeing um, pretty much my whole timeline's clogged with Carson Wentz information. So, Wait, do you feel that it's slowed down, though, or is it picking back up in the last – you know what I mean? Like, do you feel like Saturday – it was inevitable. Do you feel that it slowed down a little bit? Um, I, I feel like the talks may have slowed down, but then you're saying, you know, a, a lot of a lot of retweets and tweets from fans of this, you know, comparing his stats to this guy, you know, hypothetical trades and all kinds of crazy things. It's like, you know what, either trade the guy or keep him here, come to a decision soon because, I mean, it's, it's kind of like beating a dead horse. What do you think the, some of the holdups might be? Because – if uh, some of the quote-unquote deals that were out there are accurate, a first-round pick being involved, if you're Howie Roseman and the Eagles, wouldn't you have already done that deal? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what's happening is the Eagles, they shot for the moon, and other teams are kind of, you know, I don't know that I want to go that route for, you know, a reclamation project, so to speak. I mean, Carson was coming off a deplorable season. Yes, the ability is there, but I think that the Eagles started the, the asking price was far too rich for what teams were going to, to kind of give. So you kind of you kind of have to gauge the market and you know you get a little bit of give and take here. I mean, they're not going to be able to get what they're shooting for given you know given the situation and and the circumstances surrounding it. It's very it's a very unique situation. I know it's easy to bash Howie when you see that they're asking for two first rounders or so, but isn't that what you do when you're a general manager? You kind of reach for the stars, knowing that you're going to work your way back into something more reasonable. So I just, I know he's such a target right now, but you kind of want that, don't you? So that maybe you still overachieve once you back down from reaching from the stars, if you will. Yeah, in Philadelphia sports world, obviously Howie Roseman's public enemy number one, so he can do no right. Um, but I mean, yeah, any J, any GM hunter, as you know, is going to you're going to go you're going to aim for the for the best the best deal that you can get for your franchise. You know, it's not about necessarily the player; it's about what can we do, what kind of assets, what can we get back to benefit the Philadelphia Eagles. And you know, I I, I think for the quarterback position, a 28 year old guy who has played at a very high level, I think the asking price for two first-round picks is a good starting point. You certainly don't want to lowball yourself. Um, I mean, he may have to come down a little bit, but you have to come out swinging, and you have to be able to be like, look, this is where this is where we're at with it. And then, you know, you kind of gauge the market, and you start to see the dominoes begin to fall. Um, you see other quarterback names that are kind of floating around out there. Teams are going to quickly you know, move on to their next second and third or fourth options even. If they're not getting, if they're getting impatient, not getting, and not seeing any flexibility on the Eagles' end. Andrew Checo, football at four. Um, Colts, Bears, they seem to be the two teams that are are the names of them at least have come out, and they both have Eagles connections, right? So um, I want to get your opinion on: Do you think that, let's say, Wentz <laughs> said, "Look, I prefer to go to Chicago or Indianapolis," like? Uh, do you think there's a better fit for him that one of the teams would be more aggressive than the other? I think the best fit for him is uh, would be the Indianapolis Colts, given his history with Mike Reich, given uh, Press Taylor, who he's very close with. That that's his preferential coach by all accounts um, to to coach him directly. Um, they have the pieces in place. To, they have the, uh, a young dynamic of coaches and mixed with veteran coaches to kind of, they're on the cup making the playoffs. And I think adding a player of Carson Wentz's caliber or at least potential can put them in the playoff conversation. The Chicago Bears are in a unique situation where I, I mean, Carson would be an instant upgrade over, they're used to bad quarterback play or inconsistent quarterback play dating back years and years and years. But, I mean, and, and he would have a chance to work with John D. Filippo again and reunite, who obviously, as we know, coaches him very hard. Does he want that? Of him. Does he want that? Then that that's, that's the question. We know that 
you know, it was a lot of tough love going on there in 2017. And we don't necessarily know how, I mean, he responded to the, you know, being under constant pressure from John, but we don't know if Carson liked that. I think he, a much more, um, a much more comfortable situation for him would be to kind of slide in there at the Colts, knowing, having that familiarity with the first day or their friends, you can kind of, you know, Carson's a guy that, that's very stubborn and hard headed and, and is set in his ways um, very much so. And, and being going in that type of situation would, would seem to really be consistent with what you're hearing versus going into the, the Chicago Bears situation where you have a guy like John Filippo, where it's like, look, we're doing things my way or, or so we're going to, we're going to have a, a tough, a tough go over here. Yeah. And, and then flip it to the Colts, you know, you got right there. Uh, obviously that's uh, you got press tower there. So, you know, does he want to go back? It's almost like I'm wondering, like, does he want to go back with D. Filippo, go through the grueling coaching to show everybody, you know, they made a mistake? Or does he want to go with Frank and Press to show it wasn't Frank or it wasn't Press's fault? You know what I mean? Like to try to val. I, I, I'm trying to not that he really has a say in this situation. That's what I was going to say. It's, it's going to be ultimately. I mean, for the situation that's going to best fit him, that would be the Colts. But the Eagles are going to go with whoever offers the most for him, and they're not necessarily going to be like, "Hey, Carson, what do you you know? What are your thoughts between you know, choice A or choice B?" They're going to say, "Listen, this is where you're going." All right, Andrew, do you think right now, because as you said, Saturday it looked like they were going to do something; it was imminent. Coming days, well, look, it could still happen by the end of the day. But do you feel that the Eagles are losing leverage here? Yeah, I do. And I think, you know, having the Super Bowl on Sunday, they were waiting for that to kind of, you know, a team's got to, had a chance to stew on the sit on that, their idea, their proposal over the weekend. And then you start to get into the, then you have the, you open up the possibility of other, you know, other influences say, hey, you know what? I mean, I know this is what you're thinking, but I wouldn't necessarily do that. I think you're, you know, you'd be giving up a little bit too much for a car so much. You get outside, uh, you know, outside perspective that may, alter their decision making when you have that added time and now i now here we sit you know on tuesday and uh, you know now it, you, the, the talks kind of uh, the, the talks have gone and gotten a lot quieter you're not hearing uh, so many things you're starting to hear that no, no trade is imminent as of yet um look if he's not talking if he has a fractured relationship with your gm regardless how he's not going anywhere i don't know how you can go forward with that type of dynamic where your quarterback and your general manager don't get along so i have a hard time envisioning him being on the Philadelphia eagles roster in 2021 but right now it's like i, I do think the eagles are going to have to come down a little bit um and the teams that they're looking to deal with they have all the leverage right now When you look at other quarterbacks available in the trade market, Watson, Darnold, Garoppolo, where do you list Wentz when when you weigh the compensation it might cost and the upside or the downfall if he plays like he did last year? I mean, it's it's a super high risk, Hunter, because you don't know. I mean, the guy is so physically gifted, Carson Wentz, but you don't know where he's at mentally. You don't know if um, if the the injuries have taken its own, if the situation has left him so jaded that it's hard to repair is he willing, does he want to be fixed? Is he willing to accept the coaching? Or does he feel like he already has the answers? You have to remember, this is the guy that came in in 2016 as a big man on campus, never really had to fight for anything, never was told really anything. He was always the top of, you know, the best of the best. And, you know, last season really was his first sign of adversity due to poor play. And you have all these outside factors. You know, Philadelphia is an enormous media market. You're facing all kinds of scrutiny and, and skepticism, you know, people wondering if you lost your skills. That wears on a player who's not accustomed to doing that. And I feel like, um, you know, there's a lot of risk there with Carson Wentz, but the upside is undeniable. I mean, you're talking about a guy who in 2017 was an MVP candidate. We all know that. But I think teams, when they look at him, you know what, you know what Jimmy G, you know what you're going to get from him. I think he's, he has a very, you know, very limited upside. But when you look at a guy like Carson Wentz, if you surround him with a – he's a guy that needs to be surrounded in the proper situation. There has to be a lot of playmakers around him. You have to have the right coaching. I think John D. Filippo in that situation would be it would be best served for Carson. And I do think that if you surround him with the right coaches, um, that he can, he can get back to that level. So if you're a team looking to pull the trigger, I have to think that he's at the top of the list. Now let me ask you your opinion on this. Andrew DiCecco, uh football at four here, Sports Bash. What is – You know, the fact that they brought a new coach in here, right? And I think the answer might be obvious here, but I want to hear what you had to say on on why um, this is going the way it is. They brought a new coach in here who was with Frank Reich. 
that Wentz isn't willing to give that guy the opportunity. What does that say? Well, that that's uh, you know that speaks to the his relationship with the front office. That it only it doesn't matter. Doug Peterson, Nick Sirianni, Josh McDaniel doesn't matter who's there. It, 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 as long as Howie Roseman is there, and you know Jeffrey Lurie's right hand man, I mean I don't think that Carson realizes that he, can, he. I think he realizes that it's not going to work with that current structure. Um, there's just too much bad blood there, and that's why it's hard for me to envision him being on the roster. I just don't know. Um, now it just becomes a matter of, of what the Eagles are willing to settle for in return. But I, I think that the relationship with him and Howie Roseman is just undeniably ten. Uh, there's a lot of tension there, obviously. Okay, so that would be – so people originally thought that him and Doug didn't get along. And, you know, uh, uh, Adam Schefter said this morning on KJZ that uh, uh, that – Wentz and Peterson didn't speak for weeks, so we assume mm-hmm. that, okay, that was the problem. They bring in a new coach, and he still wants to go. So we thought that the Eagles chose Wentz over Peterson. Are they now also choosing Roseman over Wentz? Well, I mean, I think there's more layers to it, but, you know, the, the, you know, the short answer would be, you know, yes, they are. I mean, Howie wasn't going anywhere, and they tried to, you know, they they, put, they said all the right things in these press conferences. They said that they want Carson here, they wanted to move forward with him, and, and that he was going to get back on track, and they're looking forward to, you know, his resurgence. But Howie was never going anywhere. He's tied to him to Jeffrey Lurie. And then, you know, I think that they always thought that they would be able to mend the fences. And I think they realized that they've reached the point of no return. And now they're kind of just stuck at a crossroads here. Like, what do we do? Because we can't move forward with this guy because, it's, you know, it's just it's just not a healthy environment for, for, for anyone at this point. So now it's like, what can we do to unload him? We had a similar conversation about Joe Banner and Lori being together, and eventually he was gone. So does this feel like maybe that stretch that either makes or breaks Howie Roseman? If this goes down a road of really hideous football for the next couple of years, could this be maybe that stretch that defines uh, where Howie Roseman goes? Absolutely, because he's tied directly tied to Carson Wentz. You know, he, he tried he, he, he traded up, you know, to the second overall pick to take this guy. They. You know, some of it was Carson's uh, Carson's doing to his, you know, to his regression. But they didn't do enough to surround him with with the talent. And when I say that, as you look at what he what he did, what Roseman did in the draft, right? He got he got Arcega Whiteside, he got Rager, he got Dillard. So in theory, they did they he made those picks with Carson Wentz in mind. The problem is that it was poor evaluation because yeah, you addressed it, but the players that you brought in weren't up to the standard that you really needed that was going to, that was going to be an asset for the team. So, I mean, it, it all points to Howie Roseman. If this doesn't go well, if this goes off the rails, um, this this could be the final straw for Roseman. Yeah, well, uh, that's an interesting point because we've talked a lot on this show, Broads and I, and I want to get your opinion on this, is that Lori was pushed in the corner before by Chip Kelly. And he was told, I don't want to work with Roseman. And it turned out that that blew up in the organization's face. They had a fire Chip Kelly, and Roseman won them, uh, built a team that won them the Super Bowl. So do you think Lori looks at it as, look, I've been told before that this guy's the problem, and I have seen that he's not the problem. He built us a championship team. So that's why he stays so tight to Roseman. Uh, I mean, that's what it certainly seems like. But the NFL, as you well know, is a production-based business. What have you done for the last five minutes? Okay, well, and, and let me let me interject is, on is that, Andrew. Let me interject on that to the the next part of it, and that's a good point. What have you done for me? Does Lori look at it though and say, because he said it in 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 the press conference that he had at the end of the year? Hey, we'll put our resume up, track record of success up against anybody. And I just look at him saying, look. <laughs> While Howie Roseman has been a part of this organization, we have a blueprint. We don't always win the Super Bowl, but our blueprint is we win. They only have one back-to-back losing season in Roseman's era ever. The seven and nine and seven and it wasn't like four and twelve and four and twelve either. They were seven and nine and seven and nine. So does Lori say, "Look, in Roseman's tenure here, all we've done is win. We might not win to the level that the fans like." But as a businessman and as the owner of this team, 
We are constantly in play for playoff bursts. And if we're a playoff team, we're in play for a Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, you could take that as either blind faith, but to me, yeah, when I kind of when I read when I read when, when I read into that comment when he was when uh, Jeffrey spoke, it almost felt like Jeffrey realized that a lot of the picks were maybe he had a little bit more of a voice in that in that war room than many were led to believe, and Who maybe did? it wasn't all all uh, Jeffrey did. Okay, and maybe it, and maybe Howie was just doing what he was told to do, and, and Jeffrey knew that. And how he, unfortunately, has become the mouthpiece. There's a lot of ways you can kind of interpret it, but I mean, those are the two. Those are two ways you can look at it. Like interesting Jeffrey take. knew, Jeffrey knew he kind of, you know, said, this, we want this guy, we want this guy, or it could just simply be be blind faith because they've been together for so long. When we had Moshe on yesterday for football for a lot of people had the conversation where well, we were having the conversation about Howie Roseman and his relationship with people, the communication side of things, being able to relate and, and having that family vibe. And I just feel you could be so good at X's and O's of the GM, but if you don't have that relationship side of things, well, that loses a little bit of power of what you do. And I just feel like that is one really crushing area of Howie Roseman. You ask a lot of people around the league and there's that miscommunication side of things. I just wonder how you feel about that side, the communication side, and how much value there is in that when you are a general manager. You're right. And in any leadership position, no matter where you are in, in, in any company, in any, you know, any franchise, it doesn't matter. If you don't, if you're not a good communicator, you know, that's a, that's a, that's an, that's a very important piece to being a leader, being able to communicate, being able to relate, um, and he's not able to do that. And uh, you start to hear different players say different things through the media. I mean, Orlando Skandrick was a classic example. We also hear a lot of, um, a lot of chatter about how it's in former players. And, you know, if you hear it from maybe one player who got released, maybe in Skandrick's case halfway through the season, you might think they had an axe to grind. But when you're hearing it from multiple people, I mean, they can't all be wrong. They can't all have, you know, be out to get Howie Roseman, right? I mean, I think, I think, his lack of communication, uh, maybe the way that he conveys things to players or doesn't convey things to players, withholds things from players, maybe telling somebody half the story and not the entire, not the entire situation. I mean, that rubs people the wrong way. And you have, uh, and, and like I said, when you're hearing this from so many different people over the past, you know, even Chip Kelly, um, I, I think that you have to look at Howie Roseman and, and think, well, why does this guy still hold a position of power here? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, and I look, I am not a huge Roseman fan to, you know, to say, hey, you know, I think Roseman does a good job. He's not great. I think he's good at what he's good at. Uh, I, I'm in the opinion, Andrew, that the fans don't like him more for the way he looks, the way he talks, the way he's not a football guy. And because of that, it is manifest into he's the worst. Ever, and I want to get your opinion on why is it that every national ranking, if you look at the power, like a, a ranking of GMs in the NFL, he is constantly in that top 10. So mm-hmm. are we so off base on this guy? Why is he so well regarded around the league and the Eagle fans despise him? Well, he's, he's well regarded around the league for being so cap savvy. And being, able to, being able to move money around and just being a real master at that aspect of the job. But as you guys know, there's many facets to being a general manager, being a good communicator, being a good talent evaluator, and things of that nature. And those are areas where, you know, when you're looking from the, from the fans' perspective, they're looking at it saying, every week we're seeing a guy like Justin Jefferson go off, DK Metcalf go off, Jeremy Chin that was in the running for Defensive Rookie of the Year. All these players were sitting there when the Eagles and the Eagles opted to go in another direction, but they were all there for the taking when the Eagles were on the clock at one time or another. And you're starting to see teams build with all these young players. And now you're looking at the Eagles roster. That's just, it's it's just old. It's talent deficient in many areas and you have to rebuild, but they've had a lot of chances at this and they don't have much to show for over the past handful of drafts. And given, and knowing how much power Harry Wilson has, you can only look at him and say, well, I mean, a big reason why we're in this, you know, in this hole is some of it's, you know, player regression and, and things of that nature and, and just natural um, regression due to age in certain players. But they don't have a ton of young talent on that roster. I mean, you can count on one hand, really, of the guys you can consider 
bona fide blue chip guys that you're gonna that you're gonna move forward with and are gonna be a part of this team when they are ready to make that Super Bowl run. Yeah, it, and it, you know, it's it's it, I mean, it's just it's. All, and I think when you look at it from their perspective, I think that's what they're saying. I guess one interesting to to one interesting thing too is if we'd say. You know, the Eagles might say, look, the guy built a Super Bowl champion. Why am I going to get rid of this guy? Well, you just got rid of the coach who also was the coach of the Super Bowl champion. So why are the dynamics different for Roseman than they are Peterson? I guess that is a question um, that can be kind of explored. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fair question. I mean, I, I do think that the fact that Jeffrey and Howie are tied at the hip and they're so close kind of clouded, maybe clouded Jeffrey's vision. Um, and I think it's easier to replace a head coach. And, you know, when every year there's head coaches that you you wonder, how, how can they let that guy go? I mean, I thought he was good by all accounts. I think it's easier to kind of go through a, a new coaching regime instead of, you know, identifying the actual problem and getting a GM. Because let's face it, if Jeffrey has as much power as I'm, as, as you know, many believe, there's not many general managers out there that are going to be okay with that type of dynamic. Um, I mean, I think he thinks he has a good thing going there with Howie, and, and why, why ruin it? Uh, football at four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. They'll have a new podcast out this week uh, with more on this Carson Wentz. I don't know um, if it's going to be today. Let me ask you this, Andrew. If there was a mystery team, who would be that mystery team? Uh, you know, I think the Raiders would be would be a, a team to consider, also the Denver Broncos, perhaps. All right. Oh, Denver Broncos. That's one that I threw out there. All right. Good stuff. Andrew DeCecco, A. DeCecco, NFL, football at four. And, of course, uh, he, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Thanks, Andrew. You're welcome, guys. Take care. Uh, always good. Uh, really good football conversation with Andrew DeCecco here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN, the free mobile app. And if you're watching the show live at 97.3 ESPN.com. What if it was the Raiders and you got Derek Carr in return? What what would that do for you? Anything? Another stopgap guy, right? It is. I I had Derek Carr on back when he was coming out in the draft. He was the, the nicest human being ever. He does seem like that. He is like such a nice guy. I don't know if I want him to be my quarterback. Yeah, I agree with you there. He had a good year. Yeah, he has. Mo- he, he had has that like one the year. Wentz, where he had like the one big year, yeah. and then he's kind of been like different afterwards. Yeah, I wonder what's if that- his contract situation. It's a good question. I might have to take a look at that. Garoppolo makes a lot of money, big time. That's why I'm not a big fan of. But you know, you're talking about two picks. By the way, uh, football at four brought to you by Dr. Lyle and Back. Everything from skincare to cosmetic surgery. Go to ilovelyleback.com or call eight five six makeover for Dr. Lyle and Back. Proud sponsor of football at four. All right, this is the Sports Bash. This hour of the show, by the way, it's brought to you by Prop Swap, where America buys and spe- sells sports bets. Check them out online at PropSwap.com. Looks like he's got one year left until he's a UFA. Two years. Two years left until he's a UFA. Yeah, I don't know that I like that possibility. 